Thanks. Good morning. Whoa. Okay, sorry. Am I dry here? Because this is a big theater and I usually, you know, get kind of nervous. Um, I'm going to come up, up here and I'm going to do this thing. I've always wanted to do because I've seen people do that and I'm getting out of the light. But this is the storytelling position. And um, I was told that I have to come up with stories while I'm presenting because it, it makes it more interesting. So here's a story for you. Last night I was walking through Amsterdam's red light district looking at architecture and um, I passed this, this street with a red glow and I thought, hey, that must be the police or something, we'll check it out. So I walked down there and there's a, a hotel and there's a bunch of guys in front of the hotel, just a lot of them. And I thought it was those football uh, hooligans, but uh, they were PSDs. Who knows what PSDs are? Yes, one person, Photoshop documents standing around outside this hotel. And um, I got kind of nervous, and they, they looked at me funny, but I've worked with them before. So um, I didn't have a problem. But these are big guys. I mean, you can't see it because they've got all these layers on, but um, Photoshop documents are, are pretty big. I think one, one guy was like 90 megs. So um, then HTML came out. And then they started calling HTML names, you know, the Photoshop guys, HTML, um, Dom ass, stuff like that. Um, so I thought, this is, you know, I don't know what's going to happen here. I'm getting kind of nervous. So uh, the HTML said to the PSDs, well, go back to your humble Adobe. And they started a fight. So they started beating up HTML. Photoshop was beating up HTML, basically. And CSS came out pulls out a SAS 9mm and starts shooting the PSDs. Um, so one of the PSDs calls up to the creative suite and says, guys, come down uh, because you know, we're fighting the web. So um, then InDesign came down, Illustrator came down. They all came down and started beating up HTML and CSS. So JavaScript came, started hitting people with frameworks. And um, what happened then? The devices came. Um, first, it was just the iPhone, you know, and Android, because that's, those are the ones you see. So the devices uh, were pretty hard for the PSCs to deal with. They hadn't done a lot of that before. So they were fighting, there's blood, there's crop tools hanging out, and, and then suddenly the Blackberries came, and the Blackberries just kicked everybody's ass. So basically, Blackberry saved the web. <laughs> okay? So that's a story for you. Just in case you didn't know, last night, Photoshop mockups died. Okay, so now you know it. But how did that happen? It happened way back between 1995 and 1998, uh, when the pixel perfectionists came from print. And we can't blame them, because they worked in print. So they're used to doing things pixel perfect or millimeter perfect. They presented Photoshop documents. I used to work in print. I presented Photoshop documents. Well, we printed them out, we pasted them on presentation board, but it was basically the same thing. We present pretty pictures of what something will look like later on. So we can't blame designers that, uh, and clients for thinking this way, um, but now that we have responsive design and all these devices, we have to start thinking differently, actually the way that we should have thought a long time ago. So this is the, the continuum of designer and medium. Let's say there's a, a gap between designer and medium. And funnily enough, web designers often seem further away from the medium than other types of designers. So fashion designers, you, you know the typical fashion designer who's um, working with the, with the cloth, you know, with the materials and saying like, Dakota, get me a bobby pin or you're fired, you know, that kind of, they're just playing around with the material. Um, furniture designers, same thing. They make these prototypes by hand. So uh, even print designers. We designed for print. We actually knew a lot about the printing process. There are a lot of technical things that you need to know that normally would say, well, I'm a designer, you know, I don't want... I don't want to deal with the technical stuff, but why not? 
you have to know this stuff. So w when, I, when I did newspaper advertising, uh, advertising we, certain types of paper will absorb more ink. So you had, um, let's say, 85% black would kind of bleed, bleed into each other. That would make, uh, it would give the perception of 100% black. So you couldn't put 100% black because you probably wouldn't even, even be able to see the photo. So that's the kind of thing we had to know. We had to go to the printer. We had to stand there and look at what came off the press and discuss it and work with the printer to get it better. So we didn't have to actually do the development, if you will, but we did have to know a lot about it. Okay? And also, it's not, it's not feasible as a designer to have your own printing press right next to your desk. Okay? So this is funny that, that web designers, and not all of them, hopefully there are more and more web designer developer hybrids, as I tend to call them, um, the web designers are a little bit further away. So we get these designers who really literally only work in Photoshop. And um, those are the types of situations where you get de designers and developers together and they start having a fight. You know, Not as bad of a fight as last night, but a fight nonetheless. Oh, by the way, I just I made this up. <laughs> I have no idea where these things are exactly, but it's just act like it's true. So why would we do web-based mock-ups? Because that's the whole point of this talk, is to convince anyone who's not convinced here uh, that web-based mock-ups are worth a try. And when I say the word mock-up, I mean comp. Mock-up is a word that I found is easier to explain to clients what it is. If you say comp, then uh, we know what it is. Clients don't tend to know what it is. But a mock-up, everyone knows what a mock-up is. So for, for the purposes of this presentation, they're interchangeable. There are a lot of reasons why you might want to consider doing web-based mock-ups. And those are mock-ups that you present in the browser, as opposed to mock-ups that are just a static image. Um, one of those is this. Time.com did a responsive redesign. And the company that did it, Append2, they said this, managing more than 200 PSD files is not only tedious, <laughs> go figure, uh, but it can produce minor discrepancies between comps of the same page at different breakpoints. They're doing something right if there are only minor discrepancies, okay? So I don't know where they got that, but this is 200 Photoshop documents. I don't know how many pages they actually visualized, but 200 PSDs. So what happens when the client says, um, you know what? I don't like the red. We're going to make it all blue. All the headlines are going to be blue. Open, document, change, er select everything, change it into blue, close it, save it, and do that 200 times. So it's not sustainable, really. It's amazing that they did this, actually. So one good reason to do web-based mockups is almost anything you do will be less than 200 PSDs. It, it really would take a lot of effort to, uh, to get that high. So with a web-based mock-up, you could say, if you have three breakpoints, three major breakpoints, then you'll have basically one document for every three breakpoints instead of three Photoshop documents. Nothing against Photoshop as a tool. Photoshop's great. Um, I'll get back to that. Another reason is that web-based mockups more effectively uh, represent what's going to happen in the browser, and that's because they are in the browser. So that's pretty easy. And the advantage of that is you could look at this, uh, this mockup in different devices. You could see what it actually will look like. And if you think about it, um, I said this last night at, at dinner, IE6 was pretty much our fault because we're making pretty pictures, telling the client it's going to look like this, and then it doesn't. Okay? So not that we have to design everything for IE6, or had to, um, but we could have taken the client along and said, look, this is what happens on the web. You know, the web is sometimes broken. But look what happens in good browsers. You know? <laughs> we could have built it up that way. So the same way that Jeremy Keith was talking about at dinner last night, if you uh, work for mobile makes it easier because you have all these devices and you could say look this is what it looks like on these devices but on on better devices which have better browsers it'll look this way so it's a really effective way to present to your clients as well 
This is what we do with static image mockups. The we say, client, guess what? Here's, here's what you're going to get. Whether or not you like this car, um, probably a lot of people do. But this is what we give the client when we're done, right? This is what the client sees. It's not necessarily what we give them. I mean, we can defend this all we want. It wasn't my fault. Someone, you know, I didn't see it. I didn't see the wall or the other car or the person. Um, so this, this is what they think they see. And it doesn't matter what, they, uh, what the truth is. It matters what your client thinks the truth is because their perception is always going to reflect on you somehow. So whether your client is someone internal, if you're at a big company, or you work directly with clients, it's important to manage client expectations. And the way you present and the mock-ups you use to do it are a way to manage those expectations. De design revisions is another reason. They could be a nightmare. Like I just said, if you had to change 200 PSDs and you had to change every headline to, to blue, terrible, terrible. And this is. This is some nice stuff, you know. That got this whole design here. There's a bunch of red on top of it, and they're like, "Well, I like the search bar, that kind of thing." You get that? I I don't know. Maybe you're better designers than me, <laughs> but this is the type of thing that I do get occasionally, where I just think, "Oh man, I have to change everything." And admittedly, changing this in HTML or actually in CSS is not always that easy, depending on what the changes are. But I only have to do it once. And that's a big, big, big difference. Another good reason to use web-based mockups is experimentation. You can play around, you know, like, like this. This kind of thing. We love doing this, right? I, what do you think? Pretty cool? Yeah, looks good. So playing around in the browser. It's tempting, and I've done it before, to say, hey, client, come here. Oh, you want to see what it looks like? Blue, look, da -da 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 -da. and, you know, web inspector, boop, 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 blue. And the client's like, oh, OK, change the whole layout and make everything different, right? It's so easy. You're almost done. Um, so you have to be careful how you manage that as well, because you don't want clients to think, well, you have a static website ready. OK, so there are, there are lots of things you need to worry about. The web-based mockups have a whole new set of problems that we have to deal with, uh, especially having to deal with the fact that people think that they're uh, almost a finished product when they're not. Okay, because I'm going to talk about taking shortcuts to create them quickly, which means they're not always ready for production. Version control. And this, me as a designer who kind of fell into development later on, I love version control. And I love it for the, this is another story, which really happened. Um, an employee of mine, when I had my uh, company, Cinnamon, he was just an innocent mistake, but he started doing everything with the keyboard shortcuts on his Mac. And he accidentally deleted a whole project folder, and we didn't have version control at that time. It was some time around two, 2000, I think. Um, programmers had version control, but we didn't whole project folder was gone. So we had, to, uh, we had to look back through sketches and do everything over again. So it was terrible. And it happened, like two weeks later, it happened a second time. So as the, um, as the boss, I was you know, trying to be nice, but really, really freaked out. And I had, a, I had a developer who said, version control. I'm like, ground control? <laughs> what? What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, version control. Yeah, that's. He explained what it was. I'm assuming all of you know what it is. But um, I thought, wow, this is incredible. The programmers have all the cool stuff, you know. And we're we're like in the dark ages, and and all the developers are doing all this uh, this great stuff. So uh, he introduced us to Subversion, and so that that worked out um, that worked out really well. So version control is a good reason. This. This is, by the way, uh, people criticize Photoshop. You see anything wrong with this picture here? It, some people say the arm, but look at the, her poor hips. She's so, you know, it's dislocated in a really bad way. So you know, people, people don't, even if you have Photoshop, whatever tools you have, you might not use those tools in a way that 
that a lot of people would appreciate. So it's just a tool, right? Um, but we're guilty of it too as web people. Um, a lot of you probably know Jeffrey Zeldman. Um, I don't know if you remember this site, because then you know, you'd have to be as old as me. Um, this was like 1996, in the beginning of 96, I think. Um, this was Jeffrey Zeldman's website. So uh, we, we have to be careful when talking about the Photoshop people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, mistakes are made on the web as well. So the point is, it's not about the tools. It's about the medium, but the tools can help us. Tools like version control um, can help us out. Okay. So, how do we make these? There are lots of ways to make web-based mockups. The easiest way would be what? To just go open a browser, open a text editor, and start working, right? Um, not very effective. I'm not convinced that would be quicker than Photoshop at all. Um, and that's one thing I'd like to get out of the way, in fact, right now, is what we're talking about is designing in the browser. I think designing in the browser, which is something that everyone's heard, but unfortunately, I think the term doesn't describe what it really means. So uh, none of us, well, at least I'm not talking about going into the browser with just opening it and having a blank page and then start coding to design. I'm not telling designers, um, don't think creatively anymore, don't sketch anymore, just you know, go into the browser and start coding even though you've never coded before. That's ridiculous. So it's not a matter of designing in the browser, it's a matter of where you present the designs. It's the manifestation of the design and how you present that visually to whoever you need to present it to. Okay, so with that distinction, we can look at uh, how we can make these, these things. Now, making static pages is pretty easy, but there are, there are some tools, these cool programmer tools, that can help us out. And again, it's not about these tools. It's about choosing tools that work well for you, for your, for your own workflow, and using these to help you, and looking outside your own realm Look outside, if you're a designer, look outside designer tools. See what other people are doing. You do that for inspiration anyway. Or at least, if you don't, it's, it might be a, a nice idea to try sometime. Look outside your own field. So I looked at developers who were getting a bunch of stuff done really quickly, really effectively, most of the time. And uh, they're, they're really creative, actually. I, I think the developer community nowadays is really creative. I think when, once we get to the point which I'm seeing framework on top of framework on top of framework, um, you know, so based on jQuery and Twitter Bootstrap and Foundation 4 all rolled into one thing and we're calling it Sausage. Um, sausage JS, that's not the type of thing that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the creativity that you have looking outside your realm and, and finding good tools to work with. So the first thing to do when you're doing a a mock-up is to sketch the same way you do any design. Sketch. Um, if you're not a designer, then you might not be interested in this part of it. But that's where you start. I do. I use paper, and I use devices. Um, don't look at the design. It's just uh, I drew something to have drawn something. But um, this is the kind of thing I do. This idea I got from Stephanie Rieger, uh, which never occurred to me. You have these nice drawing programs for just about every single device. Um, why not open that up, use one of these styluses, and just draw on the device? Um, and you could draw on several devices at the same time and kind of play with ideas, uh, but also on paper. I sketch on paper all the time. So don't just omit the creative process. Do the whole creative process, but when you're doing it, think about the end result. Think about the fact that it's going to be on a device. Don't think within a, a certain canvas, like oftentimes would happen in a, in a Photoshop setting. So years ago, I gave um, lectures at a college on uh, developing, developing your portfolio and uh, creativity and things like that. Um, so I wanted the the students to start coming up with ideas for their portfolio and how they would present that. And about 90% of them sat down behind a computer and opened Photoshop. And they started, you know, moving things around. And I was, I was like, what are, you, what are you doing? 
um, do you have an idea? No, no, I'm going to, you know, figure it out. So, <laughs> what... <laughs> I understand that some people sketch in Photoshop. That's okay, but try sketching outside of Photoshop as well, because Photoshop has nothing to do with anything at all if you're a web designer. The, the canvas is nothing like what's going to be, uh, what the end result's going to be. It's, it's just a proxy, basically, and not even a good proxy nowadays. So um, think about that, try to sketch. That's pretty much step one if you're designing anything. Okay? It's, sketching is thinking. This is another thing that you'll be hearing a lot about. Um, uh, you, I think Sarah might mention uh, something about it tomorrow, maybe. Something about content. I don't know. But content. Very important. We've been hit over the head with it. Content, content. You know, And it's not just because content strategists as a relatively new field, are trying to aim for their job security. It's because it's really important and we've ignored it. So I've had actual clients, and I'm interested to know if you've had this, any designers who are here, actual clients who have said to me, just make something look pretty and put lorem ipsum in there, and then I'll look at it and decide what content I should put in its place. You know, I literally got that request. I literally refused <laughs> to, to do that. But that's, that's the kind of thing you hear sometimes. That people want a pretty picture. A pretty picture is not design, a pretty picture is decoration. And we're not decorators, we're designers and developers. So start rep with representative content. If you don't have representative content, that means someone doesn't know what you're going to be making. Um, and you have to ask yourself, should we be making this in the first place? Because actually we don't know what we're doing. Everything has content. And you get the, the comment every so often, yeah, but we don't have any content because it's an app. Right? So we're going to just have buttons with nothing in them, just buttons, blue. That's, that's ridiculous. You always have content. And you have to have content that represents what the actual content will be. So if it's not the real content, it doesn't have to be the real content, but you have to know what the structure of the content is. Without that, it's just like uh, designing with your eyes closed. You have no idea, no idea what you're doing. Or it's art, and I'm pretty sure that's not it. Okay? So this is lorem ipsum. It's subtle things like this. Don't, don't design around this, but design... Uh, if it should be this, then it should look like this. You need to know there's, there's a bullet list in there, there's a button in there, there's a, there's a little um, component that has a form in it. Uh, you can't just plop lorem ipsum in there and, and call it a day. So this is important stuff to know about because if you don't know it, you're going to have to do 500 iterations of your design. That, or worse yet, the client will get to it once the developers are developing. And I'm assuming most of you are developers and you don't like that, do you? Once you've built it and they're like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> We have to change it. That's very, very frustrating. So when designers and developers work together, then you eliminate this. When content strategists and designers and developers work together, you can eliminate this problem. So if you know what content is, you know how to deal with it appropriately. Um, Type designer Neville Brody once said, there's no such thing as bad design, there's only inappropriate design. Um, there's also appropriate design, but you know what I'm getting at, so. Structure, very, very important. I hope someone else talks about that. Uh, these things will help you with speed. This is a problem with uh, the, the discrepancy between a web-based mock-up and actual development templates. These will help you. Layout and grid helpers, and I'm saying helpers instead of frameworks because I tend not to not uh, like the word frameworks. I'm kind of allergic to it, but I guess you could say frameworks. Um, static site generators and CSS preprocessors. So we'll talk about each one of these uh, a little bit. These are things that normally I would be against most of the time. I used to be very, very against uh, a couple of these, like grid systems. Um, but when you're putting something together really quickly, we don't have better tools at, at this moment. 
okay? You could, if you wanted, take your web mockup and work with a developer and make a base for production. So that would really save time, right? It, instead of having a Photoshop document, which had to be translated by the developer into something that works in a browser, you could actually work with the developer and make your design work in the browser in such a way that the developer can just take it and go once you get sign off. And that would be, that would be fantastic. The problem with that approach is that I think we'd scare designers off if we did that, because then you're putting, you're not only saying, okay, you have to do some things in code now, but now you're saying, you have to do some things in code now really, really well, um, and if you don't, I'll kill you. Um, it doesn't have to be like that. Just, just chill, okay? Because if you, uh, if you think about it, we normally get PSDs, and then we develop those. So just act like it's a PSD in, in the first place, when you're first starting this approach. Because it's, it's still better than a PSD for a developer. And they could actually, they don't have to go in and, and measure things and get the, the eyedropper tool and um, see what color it is. They can just open the web inspector, uh, the developer tools, and just see, oh, those are the colors. You know? And even better, if you've documented them and made a style guide, then they even have to do less work. So you're helping developers. Um, hopefully developers are happy about that and want to help the designers out. So, uh, you know, one big happy family. <laughs> Static site generators. This is something that I think really can help when making a web-based mock-up. Who knows what a static site generator is? Okay, not quite as many as I thought. Okay. Um, for those who don't, it's just a, a, a piece of software that kind of sets up a base website for you, and the, si the website that it creates will not be um, powered by a content management system. It's just static web files. So it allows you to do things uh, like simple templating. Um, the, the simplest way to describe it for someone who's not familiar at all would, would be that you can include a header and a footer in a document, um, and it would be the same header and footer across all documents. So you don't have to worry about the header and the footer anymore. But it gets more complicated th than that with templating. You can go, you can go dive off the deep end, uh, if you like. But they're just these software tools, and unfortunately for a lot of designers, they're usually command line tools, and they involve ways of saying, set up a web project, enter, then you have a base web project that you can start on. So you're kind of making a static website, only the pages aren't necessarily connected to each other. Uh, if, you're, if you're just visualizing five pages that, that don't connect to each other within a flow, then you're just making five static web pages, and, and that's fine. So some examples of these are Jekyll, Hyde, I love these names, um, Nanoc, uh, Dexy is the one that I use. Um, this is Jekyll. If you want to check it out, probably, arguably, the most popular one uh, because it's, the, it's pretty much the engine behind GitHub Pages, if you've ever used GitHub Pages. This is, um, it's really nice, uh, I guess, if you, if you like Ruby, and it's kind of geared toward more bloggy type of, types of things. So um, uh, I used a, something called Hackle, which is kind of like Jekyll, but then written a in a different language, in uh, Haskell. Um, but I stopped using it for, uh, for, the, for Dexy, which I'll get to in a second. This is what you would do, just to give an example of what this involves, setting up a project in Jekyll. It's just these lines, basically. Um, and then you go to your browser and go to this address. And then you have a skeleton site that you can go in and um, start adding HTML and CSS to, to build up uh, something. So it speeds up the process quite a bit, actually, especially if you're doing several visualizations. I use this. This is called Dexy. Uh, Dexy's documentation software. And um, last year, I touched on it a little bit when I was talking about the responsive design workflow. Uh, I switched from Hackle to Dexy simply because I use Dexy for making style guides. It, style guides are a form of documentation, and Dexy allows you to have code here, uh, your prose here, and perhaps screenshots or whatever here, and pull those together into one document, which becomes your style guide. And it has fantastic ways of, uh, of doing that. 
Um, and they also have one filter, basically, that it's called a reporter. And it'll, it's basically a static site generator. So I thought, well, why use two tools when I can use one? Um, for me, that's, uh, that's important. I can imagine that you'd maybe be interested in either one. But this is how I would do it. Uh, just type this in, and then there are different templates. When I wrote the book, uh, Responsive Design Workflow, I, I made a template for the readers of the book, and they can put the name of that template here. And then they get the base um, mock-up files that, that I ha describe in the book. And then this is the directory where you want, th the name of the directory that you want to be created. And it just makes this uh, directory for you. And then you, you go here, and you get a basic HTML page, but once you start adding folders, then automatically every folder gets added to navigation. And it's just really interesting to take a look at if you, if you have the time. It might be kind of scary if you're just purely a visual designer. Um, then I recommend, uh, well, I probably recommend reading the book. <laughs> um, but just come to me and I'll, uh, I'll tell you more about it. Layout and grid helpers. Who uses SAS here? OK, quite a few. Yeah, and Compass? Yeah, also. They kind of go hand in hand, I guess. Compass is like a, a helper framework for SAS. I used to hate SAS. Um, I, it was the old syntax. The, it wasn't CSS. And when they came out with SCSS, I really liked it, because I, I do a lot of CSS. And um, I thought, well, this is great, because I can do things with CSS that I couldn't do before, which would save time. but. Um, I don't have to learn a different syntax. So with uh, a framework like Suzy, um, that's this, you can quickly create a layout without really having to worry about um, what, you know, how, uh, any problems you might have with positioning or anything like that. The problem comes when you start making the decision, do I want to use something like Suzy in a production site? So that's something that developers and designers would need to get together with each other and, and talk about. I, I don't know. I, I'm not necessarily a fan of the type of code that gets produced by a lot of these tools. I think Suzy's pretty good for what it does, but if you just open the CSS, then you will not understand what it's doing at all. You, you kind of have to go back into the SAS to really understand what's happening. That's probably the, the biggest drawback of something like SAS. So this is a really, a layout like this is, is done in just a couple minutes. Um, so when you're doing a design and you want to compete with Photoshop as far as speed, but you want the advantages of the web, then tools like this can be really, really interesting. Um, this is flexible, by the way. We're talking about responsive design, so Suzy is one of those. Um, frameworks, if you will, that, that allows for flexible layouts or fluid layouts. Ideally, this is what I want. I want to be able to do it all with CSS, because that's what CSS is for. And amazingly enough, we've had CSS from the early days of the web, and we've had everything. We can animate stuff, flip things around, shadows, all, all manner of things that you can do, and we still don't have actual layout. That's crazy. As a matter of fact, Flexbox, which is a fantastic spec, is starting to come into browsers, but that's not even real layout. That, that was originally developed for UI layout. So that's different than page layout. Okay, so these, these two, grid layout and grid template layout, of which the, the bottom one is my absolute favorite, um, these will allow you to create page layouts in a couple of minutes, and you can change them in a, in a couple of minutes. So imagine, if you will, with template layout that you create in CSS a, a virtual grid where you have positions that are given a name, and you could actually, re, uh, you could actually replace those, uh, those pieces and have your content move all around the page just by moving a couple of names in your CSS. It's just amazing. A lot of people don't like the syntax, but it's absolutely the best syntax for layout that CSS can offer right now. So these you can play around with partially in um, IE10 right now, and only IE10. <laughs> Go figure. Um, and Flexbox is 
uh, in varying versions in various different browsers, and I would vent in 10 browsers or 10 minutes. Do I have 10 minutes? Okay. Jeez, got to hurry up. I, you, you kind of messed me up there, 10 browsers. <laughs> Okay, preprocessors, we touched on it. SAS and less. Um, the, don't fight about it. Everyone fights about it. I, I use SAS, less sucks, you know. No, SAS sucks. They're both fine. They're, you know, the differences are small, especially if you're a designer. Preprocessors allow you, uh, as a CSS writer, just to, to do handy things that you can't with normal CSS. And you could go overboard and really mess up your CSS, so don't do that. If you're a designer, it really doesn't matter. For the web-based mockups, it's still going to be more efficient than Photoshop eventually. There's a learning curve, but you'll get over that. The same way you got over learning um, how to deal with the most advanced image editing application the world knows. So um, you can deal with this. As a designer and a designer developer, you have to have knowledge of the medium for which you're designing. You can't design blind. You can't say the developer's going to sort it out. Developers won't like you for it. Um, you just can't do it. You, you shouldn't be at a point of thinking about whether something is possible just before development starts or even during development. You should think about that beforehand. So you have to know what you're doing. It's web design. So we need to know something about it um, and more than just Photoshop documents. Luckily, it's changing. Um, I know, the, the most designers I know also do a bit of code. And I'm not saying you have to do JavaScript and um, be fantastic. I, I still, if you look at my JavaScript, I guarantee you, like 90% of you would start laughing at my JavaScript. Um, and I would start crying. <laughs> so uh, Jake Archibald edit, uh, tech edited my book, and um, I thought I was doing everything perfectly, following all these uh, you know, best practices, and Jake said, no, it's, you got to make it more JavaScript-y, okay? I didn't know what that means. I do now know what that means, unfortunately. But so you have to learn about it. Just be willing to learn, see it as a, a fun challenge. It's something fun to do, okay? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the command line, which just sits there and does nothing until you tell it exactly what to do. It only does exactly what you tell it to do. Don't be afraid of it. It's just a different interface, and you're afraid of it, because you don't know what it is. And a developer will gladly help you. Um, how many developers would have a problem explaining to a designer how to use simple command lines, uh, commands in the command line? OK, Remy would have a problem with that. <laughs> that kind of fits your personality, doesn't it? <laughs> so what can you do with these mockups once you have them? Um, you can present them. Right? That's the whole idea. You can present them to clients, you can present them to developers, or anyone you'd like. Last night, uh, we had a really productive dinner, I guess, but um, I think Jeremy said something about that there are, there are three different... Uh, Jeremy, are you here? Yeah, there are like three different um, purposes, I guess, for a, for a comp or a mock-up, and one would be for the client, and one is for the developer, and what was the last one? Oh, for the designer themselves, right. This can be potentially all three. Okay, well, I guess the designer for yourself, your sketches might be enough. But this could be all three. You don't have to make a separate mock-up, uh, which is more realistic for the developer. Okay, so this is potentially a, a big thing. You can automate screenshots. This is kind of weird. Um, if you remember, if any of you were there last year for my talk then uh, about the workflow, I make screenshots first. Once I've done sketches, and then I make a mock-up, then I make screenshots of the web-based mock-up, and then I present the screenshots to the client first. And there's, that's weird, isn't it? But there's a reason for that, because when something's in a browser, you're adding all kinds of factors. You're adding things that clients can um, think about and trip over. When you present them a screenshot, it's a visual thing, it's a flat visual image, and basically, do you like it or do you not like it? That's it. If you like it, uh, great. Now we're going to make a mock-up, which you already have made, right? And then um, 
go off for a week, come back and say, look, we made this mock-up for you. And then you can start talking about things like, uh, like interaction, much in the same way that you don't, uh, that the reason we have lorem ipsum in the first place is that you want people to, to not focus on the actual text sometimes, and sometimes you do. Um, so that's why I use screenshots. And you can automate that process of screenshots. It's just, uh, it, again, these command line tools that are uh, fantastic. Just take screenshots of every mock-up you made automatically. Um, live demos. Nothing beats the, the, I guess the first time I had my bag with several devices and um, did my research to figure out, well, how can I hook all these things up and not sit there for a half hour going like this, you know? Um, walk in and present a design for a client, a mock-up, on all these different devices, and then fiddle around a little bit and invite them to look on their device and see what happens there. Just the, the impact that that had for the client was just incredible. So I, um, the design didn't have to be, it didn't even have to be a good design. They were so impressed by being able to see it in all these different devices. Um, and you could fake it and just put a screenshot in every device if you want, but uh, just one mock-up works on all these devices and it's a great way to present to clients. So demos are cool. Testing. Usability testing, accessibility testing, any kind of testing you want to do, as soon as you can do testing for something, you should probably do it. And uh, except when you're sketching and when you're thinking creatively. But once you start working something out, the sooner you test, the better. And usability testing especially, you know, you can't do it with a PSD, except, you know, that Steve Krug uh, touch testing, like, okay, where would you put your finger on that thing you would do if you were looking for this, you know, dink, okay. Um, but now you can actually test what happens. You know, everyone's missing that button, or um, it's not big enough, or they can't reach it with their thumb, something like that, that you can test this stuff out in the design phase and not have to change things later on. You can use the mockups as a base for a style guide, uh, which is uh, what I talked about at Frontiers uh, here, using the same tool, Dexy, that I use for these. Um, oh, everyone knows what a style guide is, yes? Okay, no hands probably means yes. <laughs> um, this is the presentation. I'll put these slides up as well, but that's the one where I kind of went into detail about that whole process, so. Um, then you don't have to buy the book <laughs> for that. Web-based mock-ups, more than a pretty picture. Um, they can be useful, more effective, time-saving, uh, great for changes. You can hook them up with all the cool tools like version control. Um, generally something that I think, just um, consider them. Try, try to see if you can figure out a way to fit this into your workflow um, and change the way you think about presenting designs to your clients and, and to any other stakeholders in your project. Okay? So, have fun, keep learning. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. I think we do. I think we're going to do one question. Um, first okay. off, I just wanted to say um, I'm really happy to hear that you kind of escaped unscathed from the whole, uh, you know, West Side Story kind of event you had going on yes. last night. Yeah, um, it was tough. That would have been that would have been rough. Um, and I can imagine you must have been scared too. No, so uh, there was there was a lot of great questions. So you're probably going to get pulled aside quite a bit as you walk off. But one of the things that came up a lot um, related to so, so if you're moving to the, from, from a static mock-up kind of a, a process to something where you're creating these web-based mock-ups, um, how does that, from a business perspective and a workflow perspective, how do you do that? So like you work at some companies, like these larger companies often will have this very strict process, the rigid process with formal requirements gathering and to move to the next stage and things like that. And the developers and the de designers are very distinct roles on those teams. Or likewise, if you're you know if you're you're hiring for these positions and you're asking them to collaborate and stuff like that, how do you how do you get to that point? How do you progress there? Not overnight. <laughs> so that's basically it. You're just little little pieces. Um, so you you can't you you'll end up staying in Photoshop if you don't move in some direction. So the first step is collaboration. So when you're in a situation like what you're talking about, I would say okay now, step one get content people 
developers and designers together um, from the very beginning with the client, and they have to stay together the whole time. And I don't necessarily mean like Agile or Scrum or anything like that. Um, I just mean that they actually have to uh, give input and feedback about each other's role and work that they're doing. And if they walk through the whole project together, you're, gonna, you're already going to start to avoid a lot of problems that you have with uh, Photoshop documents right now. It doesn't solve the fact that you have uh, 200 PSDs because you want you know, visualization, visualizations of every breakpoint for you know, 50 pages. So. And as a quick continuation on that, though, if you've got the designer and the developer working hand in hand throughout, I mean, obviously that's more that's longer that you're having them each work, right? Instead of their distinct phases, they're actually working together throughout the process, so there's got to be a little bit of a cost associated with that. I would assume so from like a... In the beginning, but, but after a while, um, they'll work better together and you'll save time because you don't have as many iterations and you don't have as many changes once you start development. Okay, makes sense. It's just like anything, any workflow, any tool, you just got to get used to it and kind of get familiar with it before yeah, you get sure. to that point. All right, so again, Stephen, thank you. Um, we're going to take... You.